Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. Today is Tuesday, and I'm still reading Emma. I'm going to be reading Emma for a couple more days, and I keep thinking, like, like you know, I have my chapters that I want to hit, and I keep not hitting them, so we're falling further and further behind. And yet I have pages and pages of notes, and I keep thinking, like, oh, I can't do an update until I finish, like, chapters that I said I would read, except for I have so much to say about this book. Now my first note I shall read to you. I said, what I'm really starting to enjoy about Emma is her sincerity. She's so sincere in her plan to be better, and like all of us, she almost immediately falls short, which is true. I did like her for that, and I did really relate to that aspect of her character. But as we will see as we go through this, <laughs> through my feelings about today's readings, I have a lot of up and down feelings about Emma. And right now, I'm annoyed with her. I'm in about chapter 7 of the second volume. And I'm annoyed. But before we get there, my next note is, but I do dislike her <laughs> for her snobbery against the Bateses. So this is something that obviously we're not supposed to like about Emma. It's something that... Emma herself, her conscience, sort of comes against her for not being as charitable to the Bateses as she ought to be. Mr. Knightley talks to her about not being as charitable to the Bateses as she ought to be. And the only reason that she's seeking the company of the Bateses at the beginning of Volume 2 is because she's sick and tired of hearing Harriet talk about both the Martins and Mr. Elton because she's really conflicted about her feelings for both of them. And I just think to myself... Well, if you'd never gotten involved, Emma, in stuff that wasn't your business, then maybe you wouldn't be annoyed by Harriet's reaction to the fact that you got involved, okay? In conversation with Mr. Knightley, with the Bateses, and with Jane Fairfax, we are again sort of circling around this question of independence versus dependence. Does Frank Churchill really not have the power to come for a visit, or does he just not want to? Uh, like Emma, he doesn't want to visit. <laughs> like Emma doesn't want to visit the Bateses. It's the exact same scenario, just on a larger scale, right? The Bateses are dependent. They can only receive what visits and invitations come their way. Jane has been dependent on the kindness of extended family and on the family of the Campbells, but at least she has the power of refusal and can choose not to go to Ireland. And this is the essential power of most women in this society, is they may not have the power of initiation, but they have the right of refusal. Now, presumably Jane chooses Highbury over Ireland to continue her secret engagement with Frank Churchill, and we see that Frank Churchill enters the scene shortly after she comes there as well. But it seems to me that it is doubly cruel of Frank Churchill to then engage in his outrageous flirtation with Emma in front of her, in front of Jane, that is, when Jane has already sort of sacrificed a relatively secure home with the Campbells. Yes, she's intended to become a governess, but we know that the Campbells just enjoy keeping her as a friend and as a companion because they love her very much. And so they have equally been delaying her pursuit of this career as a governess. One thing that is also coming up over and over again, I talked about this a little bit with Harriet, where we talked about how she has two sentences worth of history. Then it came up again with Mr. Elton, where we discovered his history and what Emma thought of that as she reflected upon his proposal to her. But this word history comes up over and over again. So now it's not only just these two characters, but now we get it with Jane Fa Fairfax as well. And so the sense of history, the sense of context is really, really important to not just Emma, but also to the narrator. And in that narration of the history, what we see is that the Campbells and Mrs. Dixon, Miss Campbell as was, she just got married, they really love Jane Fairfax, even though Jane is the sort of superior of the two girls, that Jane is a lot prettier and that Jane is a lot more accomplished than their own natural daughter. And what this does is it really highlights the narrowness of Emma's patent jealousy of Jane Fairfax, and it, it highlights their good character by contrast. We do have, like, Isabella's early comments on that Jane Fairfax would be the appropriate friend for Emma, and that Jane Fairfax actually has a history unlike Harriet Smith. 
And the type of resolutions that we see between the two characters are also of note here. Jane Fairfax resolves that at the age of 21, she's going to go out and depend only on herself and not on other people for her own financial stability. Emma's resolutions are more around reading lists that she won't follow through in, reading lists that she draws up for Harriet Smith and that they won't follow through in together, the determination to actually practice her music and her art more, to be f more fully accomplished in that. And so we can see that there's like the degree of seriousness or the serious application that each of them has to have in their lives is directly proportional to their level of security. Although maybe Jane Fairfax being a more serious personality would have had that maybe more in her character anyway. It's hard to tell, but in the case of this novel, we at least have that correlation. Then we also get the history of Miss Hawkins, who is Mr. Elton's new fiance, and that history gets dispensed with rather quickly. Emma perceives her as no better than Harriet Smith because she comes from a family that's sort of risen up through trade and now has money, so you can kind of relate her maybe to the Bingleys, very similar kind of situation to that. But Harriet Smith is always going to be less regarded in a society like this because she's an illegitimate child. So she's always going to have, you know, obviously this is not a modern conception of how we judge people or what we consider valuable, but in the context of this society would not be, you know, would be slightly besmirched, if you will. So Emma's perception of Harriet Smith being the equal of Miss Hawkins in the context of her own society is really not true. In the context of a more modern or liberal, perhaps, judgment of a person, maybe that's true. But again, Emma doesn't really know Miss Hawkins, and this seems to be part of her imaginary world building. By the time we get to chapter five in this second volume, we really see that Frank is throwing Emma for a loop. And I think what is underlying that is that he's a deceptive person. He is agreeable, but he's not really decipherable, and he will be quite as inaccessible as Jane Fairfax in terms of Emma being able to get at and perceive the truth. At the beginning of chapter six, we have this moment where Emma is looking out, and it's the second day that Frank Churchill has been in Highbury, and he's walking up the lane with Mrs. Weston's arm, you know, their arm in arm, and he's sort of attending her as they take a walk about the country, and they're coming to visit Emma. And Emma sort of gives this decided good opinion of Frank Churchill that she was just waiting to see. What, how did he treat Mrs. Weston? What was his relationship like with her? What is Mrs. Weston's view of Frank Churchill? And that was going to be the final decider on the sort of person that she would perceive Frank as being. And I like walked away from that paragraph being like, man, I have never been so decisive in my judgments about other people before. I always feel far more uncertain and unsure. Maybe I'm misunderstanding this person. Maybe I'm not really understanding their motivations. Like I'm always double guessing myself. And Emma is just confident. And it's funny, well of course that adds to the humor because she's going to be wrong in so many ways. That's the whole point. She's been blind in so many ways. Blind to herself, blind to other people, deceiving herself and deceived herself by others. And so, of course, it adds to the comedy of the situation that she's so confident in her own opinions. By the end of chapter six, Emma feels like she really knows Frank Churchill well. They've been walking around Highbury, taking a little tour. And what she says makes that makes her feel that way is that they share the exact same opinions, which again is him making himself agreeable. And that's even how Mrs. Weston describes him. He makes himself agreeable, which speaks to that layer of deception that is over his actions. And I think it's quite natural for Emma to feel that she knows someone who is mirroring her because she goes around in the world trying to create little mirrors of herself, most particular Harriet Smith, who can mirror back what she wants from Harriet. And Frank Churchill just naturally falls into this because his that's part of his scheme. Can you tell that I am this is the section of the book that I just don't enjoy. I'm watching rich, privileged people behave badly and hurt poor Jane Fairfax and be mean to the Bateses, and I just don't like it. I do not like it. So that's how I'm feeling about this book right now. And Frank's haircut in London? Oh, 
gross. That's how I'm feeling today. So, my name is Alexandra. I'm a bibliophile, but I am not an Emma-ophile. Until next time, uh, I did that all wrong.